The concept of an innominate term was subsequently considered in the Mahalis Angelos. The Mahalis Angelos is the name of a ship, and the ship was chartered by the defendants who wanted to use it to ship some cargo from Vietnam. There was a clause in the contract that stated that the ship had to be ready for loading on the 20th of July. However, some days before the 20th of July, the ship was still at another port and it was impossible for the ship to make it to Vietnam by the 20th of July. This was considered by the defendants to be an anticipatory breach and they terminated the agreement. The ship's owners subsequently sued, arguing that although the ship would not have made it to Vietnam by the 20th of July, neither would the shipment itself have made it to the port by the 20th of July. In other words, the lateness of the ship would have had no effect and no negative bearing on the defendants in this case. If the readiness for loading on the 20th of July clause was an innominate term, we'd look at the consequences of the breach, namely of the ship not being ready for loading on the 20th of July. And clearly the consequences here would have been minimal or even non-existent. However, the court held that the clause was not in fact an innominate term. Instead, it held that it was a condition. And that is because the consequences of a breach of the clause had already been predetermined. Specifically, the contract stated that should the vessel not be ready to load, whether in berth or not, on or before 20th of July 1965, charterers have the option of cancelling this contract, such option to be declared if demanded at least 48 hours before vessel's expected arrival at port of loading. Thus, the effect test, or the test of the consequences of a breach is only used where the categorization of a clause is unclear. Here, the categorization was clear. The clause clearly states that the vessel must be ready for loading by the 20th of July, and it also clearly states what the consequences of a breach are, namely termination. Mahalis Angelos highlighted certainty in contractual relations. In other words, if the parties, who of course have freedom to contract, freely agree what a clause is, as well as what the consequences of a breach would be if there was going to be a breach, then the courts will enforce the party's intentions as expressed through the contract. Only where the intentions are not clear, where the categorization of a clause is not clear, would the courts intervene and perhaps establish the existence of an innominate term. In Bunge Corporation and Trade Acts, the court defined innominate terms as follows. The first question is always, therefore, whether upon the true construction of a stipulation and the contract of which it is part, it is a condition, an innominate term, or only a warranty. If the stipulation is one which upon the true construction of the contract the parties have not made a condition and breach of which may be attended by trivial, minor, or very grave consequences, it is innominate, and the court or an arbitrator will, in the event of dispute, have the task of deciding whether the breach that has arisen is such as the parties would have said had they been asked at the time they made their contract. It goes without saying that, if that happens, the contract is at an end. In other words, Innominate terms can only exist where the parties have not made a clause a condition. In this respect, we recall the case of Schuller and Wickman, from which we learned that just because the parties called something a condition doesn't mean that the courts will treat it as a condition. However, where the parties have made clear that something is a condition, or they have used words such as essential or fundamental term, and they have also made clear that any breach may result in termination, the courts will accept that as being a condition. In those cases, the term cannot be an innominate term because the parties have already determined, predetermined in fact, that the clause is a condition and that termination may follow. Where the parties have not made that clear and 
it is not apparent from the clause itself whether the clause is a fundamental term or a minor term, the courts may treat such a term as an innominate term. The courts would then look at the consequences of any breach to determine whether it was a breach of an innominate term with serious or with grave consequences, or whether it was a breach of an innominate term with merely minor or trivial consequences. Accordingly, if it was a breach of an innominate term with serious consequences, termination would be allowable. If it was a breach of an innominate term with minor consequences, termination would not be allowable. Although the development of the concept of an innominate term is very important understanding contract law, in practice, innominate terms have not played as big a role as one might have expected. The reason is that knowing about the possibility that a term may be deemed innominate, parties have tended to opt for certainty. They can ensure certainty by declaring ahead of time at the time of creating the contract in the first place what a term is. So if parties as they did in the Mihalis Angelos, make it clear that the readiness for loading clause is a condition and that it may bring with it termination if there was a breach, then the courts will accept that as a condition and the courts will not interpret that as an innominate term. Thus, the way to avoid any uncertainty that may be brought about by the concept of innominate terms is to state clearly from the outset what each term of a contract is. This includes predetermining the consequences of any breach. So for instance, where parties have predetermined that something should be a condition, they would include a proviso as to the possibility of termination if there was a breach. Let's move on now to the fourth category of breach, anticipatory breach. Anticipatory breach is a breach of contract before performance is due. This type of breach is historically recognized as can be seen in the case of Hotster and Delatour. The facts of Hotster and Delatour are that Mr. Delatour hired Mr. Hotster as a courier to join him on a trip to Europe for three months. A few weeks before the trip was to commence, Delatour informed Hotster that his services were no longer needed. The trip was to have started on the 1st of June. It was on the 11th of May that Hotster was told that he was no longer needed. Thus, Hotster had a choice between, first of all, waiting until the 1st of June, showing up for the trip, being told that he was no longer needed, and then suing for breach of contract. In other words, he could have waited until performance was due, in this case, until the trip actually began. The other option, and this is the one he chose, is to sue immediately. Delatour argued that Hotster shouldn't have sued before the performance was due, that means before the 1st of June, but the court did not agree. The court said that since Delatour had made it clear that Hotster was no longer needed, Hotster had committed what is called an anticipatory breach. In the court's words, if it should be held that upon a contract to do an act on a future day, a renunciation of the contract by one party dispenses with a condition to be performed in the meantime by the other, there seems no reason for requiring that the other to wait until the day arrives before seeking his remedy by action. And the only ground on which the condition can be dispensed with seems to be that the renunciation may be treated as a breach of the contract. In other words, if someone, by their words or by their actions, indicates that they will no longer fulfill a promise under a contract, this may entitle the innocent party to treat that contract as being terminated 
at that point in time, even if that point in time is before the contract's due date has arrived, or in the case of Hotster, before the trip was to commence. The possibility of terminating a contract before its due date had already been recognized by the courts in an earlier case, Ford and Tiley. In that case, two parties had agreed on the lease of a premises, and the lease was to commence at some point in the future. In the meantime, the landlord let the premises to someone else, a third party. The court held that letting the premises to someone else constituted a breach of contract, even though the time for performance had not yet arrived. Thus, the intended tenant was able to terminate on the basis of anticipatory breach. In Frost and Knight, the defendant had promised to marry the plaintiff as soon as the defendant's father died. However, while the defendant's father was still alive, the defendant made it clear that under no circumstances would he marry the plaintiff. The court held that although the time for performance had not yet come, in other words, because the father was still alive, the defendant's conduct, namely to say that he would not marry the plaintiff under any circumstances, constituted an anticipatory breach, and the plaintiff was indeed able to sue on that basis. The court in this case drew the distinction between the plaintiff's right to either wait for the performance time to arrive and then sue, or to sue right away. Here's how the court put it. The promisee, if he pleases, may treat the notice of intention as inoperative and await the time when the contract is to be executed, and then hold the other party responsible for all the consequences of non-performance. But in that case, he keeps the contract alive for the benefit of the other party as well as his own. He remains subject to all the obligations and liabilities under it. On the other hand, the promisee may, if he thinks proper, treat the repudiation of the other party as a wrongful putting an end to the contract and may at once bring his action as on a breach of it. Thus, the innocent party to an anticipatory breach has two options available to them. First of all, they can ignore the breach and just wait for the time of performance to arrive, or they can terminate immediately, that means before the time for performance has come. And of course, this is what happened in all the cases we've just looked at, Hotster de la Tour, Ford and Tiley, as well as Frost and Knight. However, it is important to note that this is an either-or choice. The innocent party, once they ignore, cannot change their mind and then terminate. In other words, if they choose to ignore the anticipatory breach, they would have firmed the contract and could no longer terminate. But of course, if there was a subsequent anticipatory breach, the innocent party could again decide whether they wanted to ignore the breach or whether they wanted to terminate. So for each breach, the innocent party can choose whether to ignore or terminate. We should also mention the Mihalis Angelos again. We looked at this case when we were looking at innominate terms. But this is also a case for anticipatory breach. This is because the charterers knew that the ship would not arrive by the agreed date, which was the 20th of July. In fact, they terminated on the 17th of July, that means before the performance date. In that case, of course, as we found out, the consequences of the breach had previously been agreed. Had they not been agreed, the court may have looked at the effects or the consequences of the breach. But since the parties had explicitly agreed beforehand that if the ship was not ready for loading by the 20th of July, the innocent party, in this case the charterers, were able to terminate. Therefore the effects of the breach in that case were irrelevant.